Hey, Vintage, it's so good to get to be with you. It's a special day that we're celebrating together today. Those of you who are comfortably able, will you stand and join us as we get started? We are here to declare the goodness of God and the truth of the gospel in our own lives and, and over one another. And one of the ways that we do that in rehearsing the story of the gospel is to celebrate baptism together. And it's going to be a beautiful day. Baptism gets to me every time. If I cry, don't make fun of me. But it's such a beautiful celebration as a family. And, and the way that we do that here at Vintage is um, baptisms are uh, a thing that we really want to invite you into. And so even if you walked in today totally not planning on being baptized, if there is a point uh, where the Spirit calls you to that, come. We've got, we've got changes of clothes. We've got towels. We've got everything that you need to be totally fine and, and be ready to be baptized. We would love to celebrate that with you and, and be your family in that today. And so uh, that, that is an open invitation. We've got folks that are going to be back here in this side room over here to, to chat with you about that and, and, and talk you through that process. And we're going to walk with you every step of the way. Um, but we, we like to give that invitation so it can sit and you can think about that and process that. And uh, again, we would love the honor of walking through that with you as we also celebrate some other, other family members getting baptized together. Uh, so as we declare and rehearse the story of the gospel, we sing together to declare that. So lift your voices, let's sing together.
part of the story that we celebrate together is that declaration that Christ has defeated every sin. And so we cast our burdens upon him. Jesus tells us in scripture that we are to cast our burdens on him for his, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. And so he teaches us his way. And so we always take a moment to confess that sin, to cast those burdens upon him. And so as we sing this next song together, uh, let it be in that spirit of letting the Holy Spirit show us the things that need to be surrendered, the things that need to be confessed. Whether it's sin that needs to be released and healed or uh, it's just struggles that we cling tightly to for control and security. As we continue to sing together, cast your burdens on the Lord. Church, we love to honor the word of God together. And so as we do that, will you please remain standing for the reading of this morning's scripture. 
scripture today comes from 1 Peter. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Hey, good morning. How are we doing today? It's good to see you guys. I can't wait for what's going to happen in the rest of the service. If you are new, welcome. You belong in this place. Uh, we're a family. We're going to talk about family life today some. And so there's no better day for you to have joined us. Uh, we'd love to know that you're here with us when you're ready to give us that information. Uh, we have connect cards in front of you. You can fill one of these out and give it to anybody with a name tag or put it in the containers in the front or the back. And a lot of our church is joining us online today. There's also a connect card at VintageNC.com, uh, about halfway down on the landing site. Uh, also in front of you, you're going to find these uh, event cards. Uh, we try to push these pretty often. There's a ton of events coming up, uh, like a women's conference uh, this coming Saturday. Uh, some classes in discipleship that you'll want to know. Uh, men's ministry, just a ton of stuff. And so uh, this is meant for you to fold up, put it in your pocket, your pocketbook, and take home. And we hope uh, that you will do that. I can't wait for the topic today. I'm going to pray for us, and we'll jump right in. All right, let's talk to Jesus. God, we're thankful that in the uh, chaos of now, uh, how difficult everything is, Lord. Everywhere we turn, it seems like there is a storm waiting for us. That in the midst of all of those things, we can come and sit in your presence and not forget those things. Uh, not pretend that they're not there, but have you meet us in the midst of those things, Lord. And so that's really our prayer this morning, is that you'd meet us in the midst, uh, that you'd see you created us for family, and that the uh, very nature of family is that we love and care for each other and the city that we live in. Uh, we ask these things in your great name, Jesus. Amen. Uh, so you, you can probably tell it's Baptism Sunday for us. And I can't wait for us to grasp just how joyful baptism is and is supposed to be. Uh, nothing new happens here. It's not magic. It's not uh, something that's been accomplished. It, it's a sign, a symbol of something Jesus has already done. It's the, the public day of joyful celebration. Now, it's hard for us to know why we celebrate some things. Unless we go back to the event, back to the thing that shows us the nature of celebration. Uh, like July 4th. If it's just fireworks and hot dogs, there's not much meaning there. We have to go back. Or Juneteenth, uh, to really understand the emancipation of our black brothers and sisters, to go back and fill that up. I think baptism, salvation... It's one of those things that we need to go back and fill up. And it's the same event, the same place every time to give it meaning. Uh, it happens in Luke chapter 15 where Jesus is talking about himself. And he's talking about his kingdom and his family. And he tells three stories that at first seem different, but they're exactly the same. Uh, Jesus says, I have lost just one sheep. And I'm going to leave everything to find that one lost sheep. And he risks his life to go and find the sheep out in the desert. And when he finds the sheep, he's not angry at the sheep. He doesn't take his, his little staff and break the sheep's leg like we heard so much in church. So he picks the sheep up and puts it around his neck. And when he gets home, he says, celebrate with me. I found the one lost one. Then the next story is exactly the same. He, he says, I've lost a treasure. I've lost coins worth a, a fortune. Would you drop everything and come and help me find it? And you destroyed your house and finally you found it. And you know what Jesus says? Celebrate with me. I found it. Come celebrate. And then at the end is a story about a prodigal daughter or a prodigal son, like me, probably like you, that was long way off, and the father saw him first. The father found him. And when the son comes home, it's not this lame little sorry celebration. The father picks the son up and hugs him, full body embrace, and then they go and they kill the fattened lamb, and they celebrate like never before. Uh, the story of salvation is this. Jesus wanted you, and Jesus found you, and then Jesus celebrates over you. That's joy. We're the people of joy as followers of Christ. And we've been praying in the series of salvation. It's not just for doubters and seekers. 
I said at the beginning, it's primarily for followers that the Lord would renew the joy of your salvation as we go through this series. And if you are a doubter or a seeker, it's a constant invitation to you. Come into this place and hear the greatness of Jesus' love for you. There's joy. That's, that's what baptism is. Now, it's an interesting thing. If the Father has found you and the Father has found me and we've all been rescued by Jesus, then that means we're brothers and sisters. That means we're, we're family. What I want to do with my time this morning is answer just two questions. Uh, how did this happen that we're family? And number two, what does it mean for us? And so if you have a Bible, turn to 1 Peter. It's near the end of the Bible, uh, chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 9 and 10. It's going to come on the screen in front of you and online as well. Uh, we're just going to start with the very beginning of verse 9. It says this, but you are a chosen race. And so listen to how, how impactful salvation is. It's so radical that something has changed your race. It's a chosen race. Now, I, I, need to, I need to have a little bit of an asterisk here at the beginning. Don't be a trigger person. So much of our society has their finger on the trigger, and the moment they hear something they don't like, they pull it and they blow everything up. Don't be a trigger person. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're supposed to be the least offendable people on the planet. We knew we killed God, and he loves us anyways. How could we possibly be offended by what other people say? We're the most patient people. We're the most loving people. We don't have a single enemy because we're followers of Jesus. And when I say a word like race, and later I'm going to say a word like justice, if you're a trigger person, it's just bam, 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 bam. But don't. At least hear me out, okay? At least hear me out. Race, in the way that we use it, is a modern concept that classifies people into distinct ethnic groups. And that classification has only been around about 200 years. When the Bible uses race, it's older than 200 years, and so that's not what it's meaning when it says race. And if you just hear race and you pull the trigger, you're missing entirely what the Scripture says, and I think that's so interesting. As followers of Jesus, we believe the Scriptures, we pull the trigger, we don't even know what the Scriptures say. We're just trigger pullers. Don't be those people. The concept of race and the way that we've been using it has often, most often, divided us and lessened individuals Race and racism has been a really hard thing, an impossible thing for our nation for hundreds of years. And yet, in this verse, there's a radical aspect to the work of salvation in the area of race. It's not blindness to race. It's certainly not racism. It's not ignoring the differences of ethnicity. It's something entirely new. And that's really risky for me to say. But understand this. When we talk about eternal salvation, there's nothing safe there. If eternity is hanging in the balance, how can there be safety in that moment? Now, there's many faults with classifying people based in ethnicity. And here's the main fault. It's the most egregious fault that there is. Ethnicities spread across entire nations, entire continents. It pulls in multiple languages, multiple cultures, multiple families, multiple groups. And whenever you smash a whole bunch of people into one thing, it dehumanizes individuals. It dehumanizes people, or more importantly, it dehumanizes image bearers of God. And so when the scriptures use race, it's not talking about distinct ethnic groups. Race means family. It means family lineage. And so when you are a chosen race, what this is saying is you're a whole new race. It's not white. It's not Jewish. It's not black. It's not Asian. It's the family of God. That's your race. It's the family of Jesus. That now is your race. It's the family of the Holy Spirit. And so I'd love to argue any time that followers of Jesus should be the most capable people to deal with race and racism because we've been made one family pulling a bunch of different people into a group, not dehumanizing them, but giving them value and purpose as image bearers of God. It's why as a staff and elder and leadership team, we're endeavoring to do everything that we can to broaden our ability to make all people into the family of God. We're working with a group called Mosaic that came in July and trained us for a whole day, and we have more training to come to help us be more culturally intelligent so we can love all people. We're a new race, a new family, is what it says. Now it goes on, verse 9, it says, we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We're going to get to royal priesthood because it answers the question, uh, what does this mean for us now that we're a family? But let's talk holy nation just for a moment. Have you ever been to a different nation, a different country? 
it's great fun, but there's all kind of hurdles and hiccups and mistakes that happen. Uh, sometimes you have to drive on the opposite side of the street. Uh, my wife and I were in Scotland one time, and the roads in Scotland are about the width of your shoulders. And we had this car that was too large, and it was a, it was a manual, it was a stick shift, which I love. But when you're on the right-hand side driving, and the stick shift is your left hand, but it's not down at the floor, it's up on the steering wheel column. Man, I was grinding it out. I was hitting curbs. I almost hit people. My wife's over there just like, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be, you know, just like praying like crazy. Or uh, we went to France one time, and I don't speak French. And we sat down, and we were starving, and I ordered food, and, and, and you'll never guess what I got. I got raw, gelatinized salmon. Why is that a thing? I don't know, but that's what I got to eat, and I couldn't read French, so that was the problem. And I'll never understand walking into a European bathroom, and there's two toilets. It's not a urinal in a toilet. It's a bidet, and I don't understand bidets. I can't figure it out. I don't know if it's supposed to be flowing or, or, or pool. And that seems like a really important differential that you're supposed to figure out. And I'm just too, I can't figure it out. But I love Scotland and I love France and I love Brazil and I love everywhere I've been. But if I go to those places, I'm only a stranger or an alien. Uh, like we have a Scottish pastor on staff, John Kerr. And I love Scotland so much. I'm like, John, if I went to Scotland a lot for a long time, could I ever be Scottish? And he looks at me, and in his best Roy Kent impersonation with a Scottish accent, no, just like that, no. I'm like, uh, all right, I guess not. Because there's no chance that I'll ever be Scottish. I'm, I'm just American. Now, I want to tell you about a, a nation, a, a kingdom, if you will. Uh, it's a kingdom that is ancient of days. The culture of this kingdom is the place where music was founded. There was no music before this culture had founded it. Uh, this kingdom, this nation, had written volumes of literature before humans could even write things down. Uh, this kingdom is the one that created art and poetry. Uh, the the um, eruption of pleasure and joy on a fall afternoon in your backyard by a fire pit with friends is just a foreshadowing to what this kingdom will be and has always been. Uh, this kingdom has a language all to itself. It's the tongue of the ancient one. And it meets the commoner and the elitist equally and pulls them in. It's a language of romance. And so if you're a romantic at heart, this language was created for, for you. And yet it also speaks equally to the academic elitists who are the most intelligent. And it is truth that you had never considered. This kingdom has food that you couldn't imagine. If you're a foodie and you salivate over great food, like literally embarrassing, running down your chin, this is just fallen food is what the scriptures say. That the world that we live in is, is a fallen world. And so the best food that we eat isn't even the food that God intended it to be. And someday we'll be in this kingdom, potentially, maybe, if, we're, if, if it's possible. And we'll eat food that God intended us to eat in a feast before the king. It's a kingdom of architecture. It says that the, um, the walkways are gold. It's ancient modern, if that's possible. It pulls every single person in. But here's the problem. We're not citizens of this kingdom. We don't have a passport for this kingdom. We're aliens to it. We're strangers to it. Strangers almost though implies that we could visit the kingdom, but, but we can't even afford that. This is the kingdom of eternal souls. And it's ruled by the once dead, now reliving king. And if you don't know the way, and you don't know where the gate is, there's no chance to leave this kingdom and go into that kingdom. We'd have to change nationalities. We'd have to change families. We'd have to change races. And that's impossible. Until God says this in Romans 8, 14 and 15. For all are led by the Spirit of God, are sons and daughters of God. For you have now received not the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. It's beyond our greatest hope. We were lost sheep in a desert, dying, and he found us. We were ruined and he restored us. We were aliens and foreigners, but now he calls us his. If you, don't, if you don't think that's the case, Paul goes on and he says this in Ephesians 2. For, though, for through Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. 
You are an outcast, and now you're an heir. Where are you going to get a better deal than that? If you're, if you're a doubter or a seeker, there's no deal on the planet better than that. You were worthless. I was worthless, dead spiritually, until Jesus said, mine. He belongs to me. There's a king on the throne. Do you know who the king is? According to the verses that we just read, your dear own papa. Do you know who can interrupt the king in the middle of his sleep at 2 a.m.? Only his children. You can. When the king's in court doing his business, do you know who can say, hey, can I come sit with the king? That's outrageous. Nobody can ask, come sit with the king, except for little children, who the king happens to be papa. Do you know who's on the king's mind before that person knows that the king is able to provide help for them? His children. Daddies and mamas know that the child needs help way before the child needs help or knows it. It's salvation. It's beautiful. It's joy. And all of the things that are great and brilliant and beautiful about salvation, that you are pre-loved, that you are called, that you are restored, that you'll be glorified one day. This guy named J.I. Packer, who wrote a great book, Knowing God, he says this, Adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers. It's higher than everything else. It's higher than you're pre-loved. It was higher than you've been renewed, that you've been adopted is better than anything else. How can I support this? Have you ever talked to a family that's trying to adopt a child and what they've gone through to adopt a child? We have a lot of families that are trying and wanting to adopt a vintage church and ask one uh, kind of what was the process like. Just listen to a few of the things that this family has gone through. Um, they had to pray to discern if they should adopt. They researched agencies. They had an info session with the first agency. They paid $300 to that agency to watch a two-day training, and yet that agency didn't work out for them. They had to research other agencies. They did three to four interviews with social workers who asked embarrassing personal questions. They had to drive all over Raleigh for state, local, and federal background checks. They had to do 40 hours of paperwork. They researched fundraising platforms. They had to raise $38,000 to adopt a child. They had to write a profile about themselves. They had to film a video and pay $700 to have that video edited and uploaded. They had to drive to Birmingham, Alabama for a two-day conference. This is just to adopt a child. And that, that's an epic, but it's nothing in comparison to what Jesus has done for you. He left the glories of heaven. He set aside his power and his authority. He was born an infant. He lived among us. He became the man of sorrows, beaten to the point where you couldn't even recognize that he was a human being. He descended down into the depths of sin and death and brokenness. He stayed in darkness for three days bearing the sins of every single person. He resurrected, and he didn't treat you as his enemy. He sought you, he found you, he signed the papers of your adoption, and he brought you home. You're a child of God. You're the affection of the Son. Can you believe that? What he loves more than anything else, you're his affection. God has decided to enlarge his family, and we're the enlargement of his family. Can you believe that? He's brought rebels to the throne. He's sitting on a throne, and everybody before him is forgiven rebels. He's taken outlaws and brought them and set them down at the feast. The hated race of the children of Adam have been brought in and called mine. I found Lucy. I found Jamar. I found Travis. I found John. I found all of my children. I'm just overwhelmed by this. Of this, I get emotional. I was unlovable, and he loved me. I was ruined, and he restored me. I was starving and he fed me. I was in the darkness and he is the marvelous light. When I couldn't find anything, he was the one that rescued me. How joyful is his presence. How, how much healing is just in his name that I can speak his name. Jesus is the greatest privilege of my life. I walk in the presence of the ancient one and I belong not as a stranger or an alien, but as sons and daughters. This is the joy of salvation. And this is why we ask you as followers to pray that this would be restored to you. And as doubters and seekers, that you put your hands down, finally give up and follow Jesus with the entirety of your life. This is how it happens. We're family because we've been adopted. It's clear and it's simple and it's for you. Now my second question is this, what does it mean 
that we have been made a family. You're saved into a family, but hear me in this, and I don't mean any disrespect, you're not an only child. If you're an only child, we love you, but in the family of God, there's millions and billions and billions and billions. Sometimes Christians act the worst on planet Earth. We're mean, we're impatient, we pull the trigger before we think, before we ask, before we pray. I guarantee if you ask Jesus about which trigger you should pull, there'd be almost no triggers he would say you should pull. We're family. We have to start acting like it. You're my brother, my sister. You can't just walk out of my life if you're my brother and my sister. I can't just walk out of your life if we're brothers and sisters. And so I think there are a couple of things that means that we're family members. First is this. It's really important that we find our other family members. Do you understand that? A different way to say it is this. They're lost children in your family right now. Your family has lost sons and daughters that we just... We don't know where they are. It says really clearly, we saw this a couple of weeks ago when Eric Spivey did such a great job teaching us the word of God, uh, that Jesus is for all the world. It's John 3, 16. For every single person that you see are image bearers of God, and they were intended to be saved through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so I want to say this kind of direct and a little strong. You can't be for discipleship and not be for actively finding lost sons and daughters of God. Discipleship is about the next 77 years of your life. Finding one lost one is about eternity. It's about eternity. You can't be about justice, whether that's ending the sex slave industry or stopping racism or whatever your thing might be, and not be for finding one lost one. Finding one lost one is not about the next 77 years of their life. It's about the eternal nature of their lives. Lostness is pervasive. Hell actually is real. Jesus talks about it over and over and over. And so finding lost family members is paramount. It says in this passage, we saw it already, that we are a chosen race, a holy nation. We are royal priests. Do you know what royal priests do? Uh, in the Old Testament, they were intermediaries between God and people. You would come to the temple, you would offer a sacrifice once a year, and the priest would say, you're forgiven. Now, we are not intermediaries between God and people, but we are ones who are pointing to forgiveness, but not really to forgiveness, but to the forgiver. We're pointing to the forgiver himself. That's what we do. Do you not know if you're a follower of Jesus? You have all the joy of eternity, and somebody invited you into the kingdom of God. Somebody wrote a song so that you could sit and read a song and be overwhelmed by the goodness of Jesus and be rescued through the words of those songs. Somebody gave hundreds of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars to ministries like Crew or Young Life or uh, whatever it might be. And through that, somebody invited you and, and you heard about Jesus. Somebody invited you to a gathering just like this. And some crazy person up front said, you have been rescued by adoption into the family of God. He loves you. Somebody weathered your cynicism and your frustration and your doubt and your criticism for years. Somebody prayed for you for decades. You don't even know their name, and you're going to get to heaven and look over, and God's going to say, she prayed for you for 60 years, and it's the reason that your heart's been transformed. You're found. You're whole. You live in the kingdom of God forever. And so now we love those who belong to Jesus and yet aren't found. Call it whatever you want. Call it evangelism, call it mission, call it uh, outreach, call it loving one person. But this is, this is why it's our heartbeat at Vintage. It's our heartbeat. It's the very thing that Jesus did. The very thing that he did. He left everything to find one lost sheep. You're the lost sheep. And so we now are followers of Jesus. We're not Christians who buy into doctrine and hold on to a few beliefs. We're actually followers of Jesus. He left everything to find one. We leave everything to find one. And so because we're a family, we have a family plan. One of our hopes as a family in our family plan is to do something about the million people in the triangle who don't know Jesus. In the last five years, that number has grown. In the last five years, 15% of the triangle have left believing in Jesus and are just agnostic. There's a God, but Jesus isn't he. And in the last five years, 8% of the triangle have left 
being an agnostic and just say there's no God at all. And so in the next 20 years, one of our plans is to reach 10,000 men, women, and children through the effort and work of this family to make much of Jesus, to change the million people who don't know Jesus. It will thrill you more than anything that you'll ever do if you become involved in loving one person, your neighbor, your coworker, whoever it might be. It's the most thrilling thing. To see the Holy Spirit use your words to transform an eternal soul, you'll just never be the same. So I invite you to look for the lost children who belong to Jesus. That we're family members also means that we should start to become like the family. That's understandable, isn't it? If you adopt a child, it's very common, it's important even, for the family to research that child's family, to understand their culture, to understand their language difference, if there is one. Those are all important things, but here's the reality. As that child is brought into that family, that child starts to reflect and become like that family. There's family likeness to those things. We have a good father in heaven, and we have a, an older brother named Jesus, and we are beginning to become like him. We're not mimicking the ways of the world anymore. We don't go to the world to learn and be informed by experience. We go to Jesus and we say, change us into your likeness. We're for what Jesus is for. We love what Jesus loves. We want what Jesus wants. We love everything he loves, and we stand against anything that he is against. That's why I get up here, and, and I'm so often saying, we got to do something about the brokenness of the world, because Jesus gave himself for that. Becoming like the family has historically and biblically been called discipleship. Discipleship is becoming like the family. Go make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything that I have taught. That is discipleship. And so let me tell you where discipleship happens at Vintage Church. It happens in the gathering, right now where you are, whether it's online or here. When you uh, worship through song, you are engaging with a living God in his presence, and you shouldn't leave the same. That's discipleship. When you take communion, even though communion is a little strange right now, we eat styrofoam wafers from plastic containers. It doesn't taste like real food. It probably isn't. But when you take communion, it's not this monotonous thing. You have this moment of, man, it took place in the killing of Jesus. My mocking voice mocked him as he hung in suffering. And yet he resurrected, and oh, the joy of resurrection. That's discipleship. You should take communion. As you engage with the words of God being taught, hopefully rightly and winsomely, but nonetheless, we read the scriptures and we learn and we become like the family. Discipleship takes place in community group. When you go and you know one and you're known by other people, and you study the scripture together and you eat together and you pray together, that's discipleship. And if one of those things isn't happening in your community group, it's probably because you're good at that thing and you're supposed to be helping teach the Bible or being the community person, being the hospitable person. It's not for you, it's for everyone there. Disciple one another. Discipleship at Vintage happens in classes. We offer classes pretty regularly as a church and we wanna invite you to those classes. We had a class in July about the Sabbath. We had a class last month about how to uh, share your faith. A room was packed out with people. Uh, this month we have a class about mental health, and we want to invite you to come and learn about those things. It's discipleship. Men's and women's ministry is discipleship. A women's conference on how to study the scriptures this coming Saturday. Men's group meet every Tuesday. Look online, get involved with those. Vintage College is doing amazing things with college students as they have seminars and they're worshiping together. Vintage Students is blowing up on and on and on. Now hear this, this is important. Knowing about the family and living like the family are two very different things. And my kind critique on American discipleship is this. We have all this information, but it doesn't change us and we don't do anything with it. That's not discipleship. Discipleship is looking like the family, loving what Jesus loves, and taking over the world in the love of Christ. That's discipleship. And so the second part of our, our family plan is to see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of vintage family members make significant Jesus decisions every single year of our lives and track those things. Here's some examples of significant Jesus decisions. You could foster a kid. You could adopt a kid. You could lead a community group for the first time ever. 
You could go to a community group for the first time ever. You could start praying for your next door neighbor that they would meet Jesus. You could give for the first time. You could adopt a kid through Compassion International and rescue them from poverty. There's just thousands of examples of what acting on our faith is. And it's really important because James says this in James chapter 2, verse 26. Faith apart from works is dead. Works doesn't save you. Jesus does. It's a free gift. But there's no way that we've been transformed by the love of Christ and we just sit in pews and think Christianity is reading some books. It's more than that. Acting on faith is discipleship. And if your discipleship lacks works, you're not a disciple of Jesus. It's something else. Discipleship is going to cost you more time than you've ever considered, more money than you've ever thought, more hopes, more suffering. But I promise you this, Jesus will meet you in each one of those things. And as you meet Jesus, you leave different. He changes you. He transforms you. We're a family that wants you to look like the family. We're disciples. And we're going to call us as followers of Jesus to these significant Jesus decisions every year so we can see our faith maturing and growing as we act on the faith that we have. And then finally, uh, if we've been made family, I think that we have to be about the family business, don't you? The family business. We've been given mercy. And so we become mercy givers. That's the family business. We're mercy givers. The, the biblical word for mercy givers is justice. And that's another pow, 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 pull the trigger, pull the trigger, pull, 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 pull. what justice? I'm not talking about social justice. I'm not talking about judicial justice. I'm not talking about Republican justice or Democrat justice. I'm talking about biblical justice. Biblical justice is this. It's all through the scriptures. You can't go anywhere and not find it. It's why I refuse to change the word justice. It's all through the Old Testament. It's all through the New Testament. Justice is the least, the last, and the lost are immensely important and in the center of the heart of God. The least, the last, the lost. And we, every time we see the least, the last, lost, should be quick to give them mercy. 1 Peter 2.10 you have received mercy. You've been on the receiving end of the family business, and now we want to give it out. Vintage Church uses considerably more than 10% of the budget that we have, entrusted by you, to give justice out. Not only in church plants that we spend a lot of money on, not only in supporting great ministries like Focus and Crew and Young Life, but justice ministries. Listen to some of the justice ministries that we partner with, serve, and give money to. Layers of Dignity, Carol's Kitchen, Corral, Rally Rescue Mission, CRU, Postscripts, Families Moving Forward, Durham Rescue Mission, Reese City, Compassion International, Foster Care and Adoption Ministry, Lifeline Children's Services, Hope for Hunter, Note in the Pocket, Refuge Hope Partners, Safe Families, Set Up Ministries, Laurel Park Elementary, on and on and on. And yet as we look around the triangle, what we see is gaps in mercy ministries, gaps in justice being done to people. And when we see gaps, do you know what we're supposed to do as followers of Christ? We're supposed to go fill those gaps. And so we want to start 20 ministries in the next 20 years to fill gaps of justice in our city. Not redoing things that are already being done well, done better than we could ever do, but finding the gaps and going in and filling those gaps so we can earn the right to tell those people about the loveliness and beauty of Jesus. That's why we give mercy. We um, are working on foster ministry. And uh, if fostering children is not your thing, that's okay. There are a lot of people that are. And as a family, we're about a diverse number of things because the Lord's laid something on your heart real passionately and you're supposed to chase that. There are people at Vintage Church that are real passionate about changing and chasing foster children. Here's why. Listen to this. It's really shocking. Some stats on why foster care, keeping families together and supporting them as they age out is so important. National studies have shown that within two to four years of leaving the foster care at age 18, these things happen. 40% were homeless. 40% were receiving public assistance or were incarcerated. 40% experienced drug and alcohol abuse. 46 didn't finish high school. 51% were unemployed. 84% became parents. 60% of them were in sex trafficking victims. All these have been in foster care. So do you know what we're doing at Vintage Church? We're starting a conversation. 
four or five people at Vintage Church led this gathering just a few weeks ago. Picture, this is just about half the crowd. It hooks around to the right as well. As a church really begins thinking about engaging in what we could do about um, those numbers that you just saw. Do you know what's beautiful? A family member at Vintage Church came up and said, what if we start a coffee shop that only employs people that just got out of the foster care system who are at risk of all of those percentages that would just blow their life up? And what if we became family to them? What if we provided them hope and finances and dignity? And what if we had the opportunity to share Jesus with them? And we've come beside that family and we're hoping to do that thing as one of the 20 ministries that we're going to start. I don't know what your thing is. It might be foster care and your heart's just beating really fast right now. I've got to do that. Maybe it's finally ending the sex slave industry. Maybe it's uh, your doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist and you could start a medical clinic. They are medical clinics in Raleigh, but there's not enough. Maybe you could start an after-school program and tutor kids. There's a thousand things that you could do. But the family business is giving mercy, and we have a goal of giving mercy for the next 20 years. Y'all, there's a lot in front of us. A million lost people. A city growing to three million people in the next few years. Suffering everywhere. We don't have the time. We don't have the people. And we don't have the resources to engage this. And so for the first time ever, I'm going to ask you to do something in the 18-year history of Vintage Church. Beginning October the 10th, we're starting a six-week series called Bound. It's the fuel to accomplish the three goals that we have as family. 10,000 people meeting Jesus, becoming like Christ as followers in discipleship, and giving out justice. Would you, over those six weeks, come every single week? It's the first time I've ever asked that. I don't want to be legalistic. I'm not trying to throw the hammer down. I just believe it's so important that you hear what the Lord has called us to, the fuel to do the things that the Lord has done. It's going to be talked about in those six weeks. If you don't come in person, join us online. Wherever you are, if you travel out of town, it's really easy. Anytime on Sunday, just to open the laptop, pull your phone out, and walk through with us. We're called to love this city and change it as followers of Jesus. And that's the church that we are. We're going to give everything that we are over the next 20 years to do that. I love you. You're my family. I'd love to talk to you after the service if any of these things inspire you or frustrate you. Let's pray now and ask Jesus to move in our city, all right? God, we're immensely thankful for who you are, what you've done, and what you've called us to. We're just overwhelmed, Lord. I can't think of anything else to say. That you loved me when I was unlovable. That you rescued us when we were ruined. That when we were starving and dying, you, you were the good father to pick us up and restore us. God, would you make us like you so we can go and be mercy givers. How kind you are to us, Jesus. We love you, and it's in your name that we pray these things. Amen. Uh, we'll respond today in just a couple of ways. I want to invite you to come and respond. Uh, we're going to sing songs about the greatness of Jesus. You stand in the presence of the Holy One. We should worship Him and leave different. And so if you're a follower of Christ, uh, let's respond that way. Uh, we would love for you to consider giving to Vintage Church. Um, we are using everything that you have to do the three things that you just heard about. And so you can give in the bowls in the front and the back. Or uh, the easiest way is to text VINTAGE to 77977. And then finally, it's Baptism Sunday. When uh, folks are baptized and they come out of the water, it, it references uh, the water is death as they're underneath it. And they come out, it's life. And we just erupt and joy when they come out, as it says in Luke 15, all the heavens rejoiced. We get to rejoice with them. And so uh, rejoice. And if you haven't been baptized, as Tyler Wright said earlier, today's a really good day. Uh, we have pastors over here to talk to you about baptism and clothes to change into. We just ask you to consider uh, being baptized. Let's stand together now as a family and worship Jesus. Walking around these walls 
Good morning. How's everybody doing? All right. Guys, this is Carly. Give it up for Carly. All right, y'all. Guys, Carly has been with us for a couple of years, guys. She works incredibly hard uh, for our community at one of the top hospitals uh, in the country. Yet that isn't what brings her here today. That's not what gives her grace. That's not why Jesus saves her. It's not our works. It's not what we do. Uh, Carly has been a Christian for a number of years now, and she is ready publicly to share that with you all today. So we are here because you have agreed and you recognize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, and that Savior can only be Jesus. You are eternally separated by God except through Him. Because of Jesus' life, His death, and His resurrection, uh, you can be here. And that recognition is what makes it so magical and beautiful, right? 
you won't be perfect. This is not a display of perfection. Coming out of the water is not going to make you perfect, but you get to be in this church and this family forever. Awesome. Let's do this. Carly, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. goodness <laughs> are you so excited that's okay it's all right here let's, why don't you stand right here okay guys this little human this is Selah Selah has been my friend for a long time her daddy and I have been good friends for a long time and Selah Selah has is ready to show you all how much she loves Jesus and that she knows that she is here today because Jesus saved her, right? And that you are in need of him and only through Jesus you can be saved. Because he lived and died and rose again, you get to be here and you get to be with us and his family and you get to be with him through all eternity. Is that right? Yes. Selah, I'm going to baptize you now with your daddy here. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Guys, this is Abigail. This is Sailor's sister. She is so ready. Guys, Abigail, again, has been one of my good friends. I've known her and her family for years, as I just said earlier with Selah. Abigail, we are here because you trust Jesus as your Savior, correct? You know that you can only be here because he lived on this earth, that he died, and that he rose again for you. You're now part of his beautiful family. You're part of his church, and you get to be here with him for all eternity. All right, girl. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We got one more Michael. We're having a party. <laughs> How exciting. Oh, my goodness. Are you so pumped? Are you so nervous? No, you're doing great. Guys, this is Evie. Evelyn. I call her Evie. This is Evelyn. <laughs> she is here with her twin sister and her little sister, Selah. Her daddy is here with me. Evelyn, we are here because you believe that Jesus is your only salvation. That only through his love for you, grace, and that he died for you and rose again for you, can you be saved? You are forever in him, and you're for always going to be with him, and he'll never, ever, ever leave you. How exciting. Okay, I'm going to baptize you now, okay? Sound good? All right. Girl, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Francis, this is my youngest. She's 10. She's been a Christian for a number of years now. She's believed for a while. But today's the day she wanted to show all of you that she loves Jesus, that she knows who he is, that she recognizes that she is a sinner. And without him, she'd be forever detached and separated from God right? Okay, Frankie, you ready, girl? All right. Francis Pauline, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. (laughs) 
Y'all, we've got towels, we've got shorts, shirts, bags for wet clothes. If your heart has been moved, if you've been a Christian for a while and you want to be baptized today, if you are a seeker or a doubter and something in you has turned on a fire to God and to know who Jesus is, we have people backstage or back to the side here who can talk to you, walk you through that, and you can even be baptized today, all right? His family is open for all. We are not aliens or strangers. Let's keep worshiping and we'll have a couple more baptisms to go. All right, y'all?
It is like a hot tub. It's like a hot tub. Hey everyone, I'm Matt. This is Kristen, and this is Hazel. She's getting baptized today. <laughs> Hazel, your mom and I named you Hazel Grace, and that's because we are enamored with God's grace. And it's not only your name, but grace is what means that everything we just sang, everything we've heard today, all about God's love and being part of God's family, it's because of grace that it's true for you. And so that's what you're declaring today, that this is your spiritual family. We are your brothers and sisters. And for all eternity, God's grace means that you will be a part of his family forever. And so your mom and I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jordan, and I'm one of the pastors here at Vintage, and it's my great privilege to baptize one of my best friends at Vintage, Jennifer Murphy. Uh, when I started here at Vintage uh, in, in ministry, uh, Jennifer and her husband, Michael, uh, were such an encouragement to me. They brought so much life uh, to ministry. Uh, ministry is really hard, and I've never went uh, to a coffee or a lunch or had them over to our house. Uh, Jessica and I, without being super encouraged. Uh, it's a massive, massive privilege as a pastor uh, to uh, baptize Jennifer today. So I'm going to ask Jennifer the four questions that have been asked of everyone uh, who gets baptized throughout history. Uh, the first one is, Jennifer, do you understand that you're a sinner in desperate need of God's grace? Uh, secondly, do you understand that Jesus is a great Savior and through his life, death, and resurrection, you're reconciled to God? And then thirdly, do you uh, commit to imperfectly, imperfectly, imperfectly following Jesus for as long as you live? And then fourthly, do you uh, seek, uh, promise to seek the, the good and, and service of his church? Well, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you. Next, we have a, a diamond child. Caston's joining me. There's a step down right here, buddy. Uh, Caston today uh, decided that he wanted to publicly proclaim his faith and trust in Jesus. And what happens when somebody decides that is we, uh, they go back there and we just talk with them and make sure that they understand the gospel, that God created them to know him personally, uh, but through nature and choice, uh, Caston was separated from God through sin, but the good news is through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, anyone can be reconciled to God if they just believe and trust in Jesus. And that's what Caston has done, and now he wants to publicly proclaim that to his church family. So Caston, I'm going to ask you the four questions that I've asked uh, everyone that's got baptized. Uh, do you know that you're a sinner in desperate need of God's grace? Do you know that Jesus is a great Savior, and through his life, death, and resurrection, you're reconciled to God? Well, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, I'm going to baptize you. We have clothing, uh, we have uh, swimming trunks, we have everything you need to get baptized. Uh, we'll be hanging out out about there. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, come, we'll talk to you, and we'll keep going the rest of this morning.
Thank you for being here. Whether you're in the room or you're watching online, um, it's good to see new faces too as we come together as as family here at Vintage and, and family beyond that uh, to celebrate what we celebrate here with baptism. Uh, I want to invite you. Uh, we've got other services. So if you're on the edge of that, I might want to be baptized. Come talk. Let's let, 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 let's uh, find answers for your questions and, and let's talk about that because uh, we really would love to still invite you into that time to be baptized. Church, we love you so much. It's so good to be with you to declare and rehearse the story of the gospel. It's where we remember who we are as the children of God, who he is and what he's done and the way that he loves us. Until next time, go in peace.